Hello and welcome to the MCA Services YouTube channel. In this presentation, we're going to be following on from our previous one on gas adsorption isotherms to consider desorption isotherms. And we'll look at the appearance of hysteresis between adsorption and desorption isotherms. So if you haven't seen the presentation on the adsorption isotherms, do have a quick look at that if you need any information about the types of isotherms and how they relate to sample porosity. In our presentation on adsorption isotherms, we showed the six classifications of isotherm type based on their profiles. That's the BDDT classification. Now in this presentation, we won't consider the types 3, 5 or 6 isotherms. We also won't be considering the type 1 isotherm, as the desorption process typically follows the adsorption down to very, very low relative pressures, and we can't really determine any great information from the desorption branch of the type 1 isotherm. Previously, we showed the adsorption isotherms, but it's worth a very quick recap. This is a theoretical adsorption isotherm. Adsorption to a non-porous sample material, and this would apply to a range of adsorbates at cryogenic temperature, for example nitrogen. As we move from low to re high relative pressures, we can see three separate regions to the isotherm. At low relative pressures, the isotherm curvature is due to preferential adsorption to the more attractive surface sites. And this is followed by progressively less favoured sites. And by favoured, we're of course referring to sites that are energetically favoured for physical adsorption to occur. This region is of course used for the calculation of specific surface area, for example by BET analysis. The middle part of the isotherm shows only a very slight increase in adsorption volume as multi-layer adsorption occurs before there's a sharp increase in volume as relative pressure approaches saturation. And in the case of nitrogen adsorption, this would be very close to 1. This increase in adsorption volume is due to the bulk condensation of the adsorbate. Desorption is essentially the reverse process to adsorption. In practical terms, once the highest adsorption pressure has been attained and the adsorption volume has been determined, pressure is gradually and incrementally reduced, and the adsorption volume is measured as adsorbate is removed from the sample. Now, in the case of this theoretical isotherm on a non-porous sample, the desorption branch of the isotherm would be expected to follow the adsorption. That is to say, the process of adsorption is perfectly reversible. Now, if we consider the, uh, the isotherm of a porous material, for example, nitrogen adsorption to a mesoporous sample, which we showed previously to give a type 4 isotherm, we, and we will consider the simplest pore geometry as well, and that is open-ended pores of cylindrical geometry. In this case, the desorption branch does not follow the adsorption, and we observe hysteresis between the two isotherm branches. The hysteresis is due to the physical processes of adsorption and desorption being really quite different. Pore filling during adsorption is by a process of condensation, whereas pore emptying during desorption is by a process of evaporation. The mechanism of pore filling during adsorption is by a process of condensation. And this occurs from the pore walls inwards to the centre of the pore via a process of successive multilayer adsorption of adsorbate on adsorbate. So adsorption occurs from the sides of the pore, sides of the pores inwards until the pore is completely filled. On the other hand, pore emptying during desorption occurs by the process of adsorbate evaporation from the surface of the adsorbate and that is from the top of the pore downwards. Of course, this is very much oversimplified, but it does give a very good in illustration of the two processes. If pores were open-ended cylinders and totally uniform, as in this example, both the adsorption and the desorption isotherms would present as very steep pros, uh, profiles due to the narrow range of pore diameters, or widths. We cover this in much, much more detail in our next presentation on the origins of isotherm hysteresis.
So we can now go on to look at the classifications of hysteresis types and their relationship with pore structure or textural properties. As we can see here, there are six general classifications of isotherm hysteresis, and these vary according to the shape of both the adsorption and the desorption isotherms. The approach to describing these is really quite similar to that that we applied to the adsorption isotherms and their relationship with pore sizes presented previously. Indeed, looking at the adsorption isotherms shown here in red, we can see that they are either type 2 or type 4. And the significance of this was discussed in our previous presentation on adsorption isotherms. Before discussing the types of hysteresis, though, it's worth focusing our attention on what information we're seeking to derive from adsorption and desorption isotherms. The profiles of the adsorption and desorption isotherms provide information on pore geometry or pore structure, essentially how open or restricted pores or porous networks are. By applying a suitable model, most commonly the BJH method or models, we can derive pore size and pore size distribution information. The pore volume of a sample can be determined either by application of the Gervich rule to give a total pore volume from the sorption volume very close to saturation, or it can be calculated within a desired pore size range, again using the BJH method. When determining pore sizes and volume, we have a choice to make though, and that's whether to use the adsorption or the desorption isotherm. And as we'll see, we quite often have to consider the pore geometry when making this choice. And a final point to note is that when using desorption isotherms, we have to be aware of loop closure. That's the point at which the desorption isotherm returns to meet the adsorption isotherm. In particular, hysteresis types 3, 4 and 5 show a sudden reduction in the desorption volume, and we'll discuss that a little bit later on. So now we can go on to look at the various types of hysteresis. The first thing to note here with type H1 hysteresis is that we have a type 4 adsorption isotherm, and that tells us that the sample is mesoporous. This feature is the steep volume changes in both adsorption and desorption isotherms in the respective regions of pore filling and pore emptying. And this is generally associated with mesopores of a fairly uniform open geometry or a pore network of uniform size and reasonably free of restrictions. Another feature is that hysteresis between adsorption and desorption isotherms is evident. And this is called, caused by delayed adsorption in, into the open pore structure. Thermodynamic equilibrium between the condensed liquid phase in the pores and the vapour phase external to the pores is actually established on desorption. But we do need to be a little bit careful when assuming this pore geometry, as this overall isotherm profile can also be obtained with a classic ink bottle pore model when pore necks and cavities are of really quite reasonably similar dimensions. Here we have type H2 hysteresis. As with type H1, this also occurs with type 4 adsorption isotherms. Both the type H2A and B are associated with more complex pore structures than type H1, the structure having internal restrictions or pore blocking. In the classic representation of ink bottle pores, this is also associated with narrow or restrictive pore entrances or necks. With type H2A, the desorption isotherm is steep with respect to the volume change, and this is due to the size of pore entrances or the size of restrictions being really quite uniform. The more gradual slope of the adsorption isotherm is suggestive of larger pore cavities lying beneath the or beyond the pore neck with greater variability in size. The converse is true of type H2B hysteresis. The more gradual slope of the desorption isotherm is now indicative of the sizes of pore restrictions or pore entrances covering a greater range, thus being less uniform. Both the adsorption and the desorption isotherms provide very useful information 
The adsorption isotherm describes the size of the pore cavities or pore bodies. And the desorption isotherm describes the dimensions of pore entrances or the restriction within the porous network. Here we have type H3 hysteresis. Now we have a type 2 adsorption isotherm, and the presence of hysteresis strongly suggests the presence of porosity. In this case, type 2 nature at high relative pressures is indicative of larger size macropores which are not completely filled as saturation is approached. H3 hysteresis is associated with plate-like or layered structures. A key feature of H3 hysteresis is the sharp and abrupt closure of the desorption isotherm to the adsorption. And for nitrogen sorption at 77 Kelvin, this occurs at about 0.45 relative pressure. We'll look at this in more detail a little later, but essentially it's due to the onset of cavitation or bubble formation during desorption. And because of this, the desorption isotherm becomes less useful for characterising pore size. And we'll show an example of this a little bit later on. Type H4 hysteresis, the isotherms aren't too dissimilar to those of type H3, but now the adsorption isotherm is a hybrid, showing the high adsorption volume at low pr relative pressures typical of type 1 isotherms, followed by type 2 character at relative, high relative pressures. Therefore, the sample material possesses porosity within the microporous range and the mesoporous or small macroporous ranges. Again, the presence of hysteresis strongly suggests the presence of porosity within larger pores. And type H4 hysteresis is most commonly associated with microporous, mesoporous, zeolites and carbons. Like type H3, it shows this sharp, abrupt closure of the desorption isotherm to the, uh, to the adsorption. And therefore, the desorption isotherm again becomes less useful for characterising pore sizes. Type H5 hysteresis is really quite uncommon compared to the others we've just seen, but it is worth briefly considering. The adsorption isotherm is type 4, so we're considering mesoporous samples. The change in gradient to a more gradual decrease in adsorption volume during desorption is associated with porosity existing in environments of varying restriction to pore geometry or within the porous network. Again, we see this sharp abrupt closure of the desorption isotherm to the adsorption, and again, as with types H3 and type H4, the desorption isotherm becomes less useful when characterising pore sizes. So the key question is, should we be using adsorption or desorption isotherm data to derive pore size information? The importance of choosing whether to use adsorption or desorption data uh, when applying, for example, BJH models, is demonstrated with this isotherm we collected here at MCA Services on a si uh, sample of silica alumina. Hysteresis between adsorption and desorption isotherms is clear, and in, all, in order to determine pore size and volume data, we can apply the BJH method to either the adsorption or the, or the desorption branch. Results are shown overlaid here. Adsorption data in red and desorption data in blue. Both are same, set to the same pore size range, that's 2 to 100 nanometers diameter. And the pore volumes, that's to say the area under the respective curves, are actually very similar. 0.25 cubic centimeters per gram from the adsorption data and 0.26 from desorption. However, the pore size distribution from the desorption data is much narrower and present at smaller pore sizes. Indeed, the average pore sizes are quite different, calculated at 9.1 nanometers from the adsorption and 8 nanometers from desorption. The question then becomes which is more accurate, 
In the case of an open-ended cylindrical pore geometry, it's generally accepted that the desorption process is in thermodynamic equilibrium between the liquid adsorbed phase in the sample pores and the external gas gaseous phase. By this argument, the desorption data should be preferred. However, as pores become more constricted, either through restriction of their sizes within a pore network or pore blocking of discrete pores, it may be that adsorption data becomes preferred or just as useful in combination. Finally, we have to consider the uh, isotherm times which show the sudden abrupt closure of the desorption branch to the adsorption. And this will be demonstrated uh, used to demonstrate the limited usefulness of desorption data to the de uh, determination of pore sizes. This is a, uh, an isotherm collected here at MCA services uh, by nitrogen adsorption to a Y-type zeolite sample. And it's a perfect example of type H3 hysteresis, with the loop closure clearly evident between relative pressures of 0.45 and 0.5. If we now look at the BJH pore size distribution plot, we can immediately see the effect of this loop closure on the pore size plot from the desorption data, shown in blue. The plot is dominated by the sharp peak centred at 3.8 nanometers, and this is entirely due to loop closure rather than real porosity within the sample. The consequences on numerical data are quite profound. Average pore diameter is 13.3 nanometers when calculated from the adsorption data, but is reduced to 9.4 nanometers when calculated from desorption. Likewise, pore volume is higher when calculated from uh, the desorption data, which includes this peak. 0.175 cubic centimeters per gram from desorption data compared to 0.155 centimeters per cubic gram from, uh, from the adsorption. That's 13% lower. So now a more accurate representation of pore size is provided by the adsorption data. However, if it's decided that desorption data should be used, it can only be applied to the pore size range which excludes this sharp peak. And that's above pores of 4.5 nanometers in size, in diameter or width, in the case of nitrogen sorption at 77 Kelvin. That just leaves me to say thank you for watching. I hope that this has been useful to you. If you want further uh, reading, then the rec uh, recommended reference is shown here on screen. And don't forget, we have the other uh, presentations on adsorption isotherms and also a presentation detailing, discussing adsorption hysteresis in far, far more detail. Thank you for watching.